F66 has been seen in quite a few handhelds, namely from Ambernic, but How Kitty, feeling a bit left out, has decided to join the RK3566 ring with their own entry in the space. The RK2023 is their latest handheld that is entering the sub $100 price point that comes in a compact size and has the potential to become a new standard for budget handhelds. This is also the first time that I will be going fully in depth with a Pal Kitty handheld, as well as the RK3566 SLC. So please join me, Rob, the Retro Tech Dad, as we examine Pal Kitty's latest and find out if the RK2023 is a budget option worth considering. Alright, let's get to know the Pal Kitty RK2023, which comes with a 3.5 inch 4x3 aspect ratio IPS OCA laminated display at a resolution of 640 by 480 It is powered by the Rockchip RK3566 with four Cortex-A55 cores running at a frequency of 1.8 GHz. It is equipped with 1 GB of LP DDR4 RAM and comes with a 16 GB micro SD card for the operating system. There are two micro SD slots, one of which is used for the operating system and the second one which is used for the games. In addition, there are two USB Type-C ports for charging and data as well as a mini HDMI output for an external display. This device has no built-in Wi-Fi. It is equipped with a 3500 mAh battery that provides up to 8 hours of battery life according to Pal Kitty. Other features include stereo speakers, 3.5mm headphone jack, and an optional secondary micro SD card which can be purchased in various sizes. The device comes with a build of Gel OS out of the box and is available in a white or black colorway. The cheapest version of the device is available for $74.99 US dollars and goes as high as $94.99 US dollars direct from the Pal Kitty website with some additional discounts available through coupons. Personally, I purchased my unit directly from the Pal Kitty website when it launched for about $90 US dollars shipped. The device dropped in price about a week after receiving it. Alright, let's get this thing unboxed and I've got to say this thing is packed tight. Alright, let's try this another way and I have to tell you that this is actually not my first time unboxing this device. I usually like to unbox the moment I get the device and then keep the footage until I'm ready to take a thorough look, but I think I accidentally deleted my original footage, so we will go through this whole process again. Okay, here we have the pretty standard USB Type-C to USB-A cable and the most basic instruction sheet, but not a bad thing to have as a quick reference, but yeah, this is about as cheap of a printout as you can get. And Pal Kitty was kind enough to include their quality control card, and it does appear my unit has passed the test. And the best thing about this is the inclusion of the Pal Kitty mascot that Team Pandora so kindly named Palkun, and thanks to my craziness is now available in sticker form. So yeah, a pretty bare bones box, and again, not all that surprising given the price. Alright, let's focus back on the actual handheld, and anytime these devices come in one of those cheapo plastic trays, you're sure to find some quality. And finally, time for the baggy release and device reveal. Let's now take a quick tour around the device, and starting from the top of the device, we have the inline shoulder buttons. The buttons definitely rattle, and I'll be talking about that more in a moment. These shoulder buttons are quite clicky, obviously using dome switches. They are very reminiscent of Ambernic shoulder buttons, but a bit stiffer than some other devices, and like those devices, the R2 is raised so it is easier to reach. They do press down properly though, and I'm not noticing any issues there. Moving along, we have the power and reset buttons, the mini HDMI port for video out, volume up and down buttons, and finally the left inline shoulder buttons. Similar to the right set, they do press down well and are quite clicky at that. Nothing to note on the left side, and continuing to the bottom of the unit, I have to say this two-tone look really reminds me of those At Games Genesis handhelds from a few years back. Anyways, we have our downward firing speakers here, one of the USB Type-C ports, the micro SD slot for the OS, a 3.5mm headphone port, and the second micro SD slot for your games, and finally the OTG USB Type-C port. Coming around the right, there is nothing worth noting here, and finally on the back, which is pretty simple and has a bit of a texture at the ends and nothing else too exciting. 
Alright, so let's take a closer look at the front of the unit, starting with the controversial D-pad. I remember when the first images came out of this unit, and certainly it was the cause of some divide among the community. The D-pad is actually better than it looks, with it pressing down at the ends nicely with a good amount of travel. I will definitely say that the edges really needed to be smoothed out, and I will see how this affects long-term play. You can really see how well this pivots though, which I personally like on a D-pad, and I find it to be very satisfying to use. We have the select button here, which is using a very stiff dome switch, and finally the switch style analog stick, which has pretty much become a common place for these devices. You can see that it sits slightly above the face of the unit, allowing it to retain some of its compactness. I'm not noticing any issues with the analog stick right now, and it does seem to have good movement. These are not using Hall Effect analog sticks. On the display bezel, we have that RK2023 printing, which definitely cheapens the look of the device. I'm not really sure why this was a design choice. And now a quick look at the start button, which is identical to the select button. And then the face buttons, which are presented in the Nintendo style BAYX configuration. These are membrane based and are a lot better than I was expecting, especially coming from Pal Kitty. These have really good travel and they press down quite nicely. You can see that when I fully press down, they still sit above the face, which is what I like to personally see. These are quite thunky, and again, I'm actually very surprised by them. Okay, let's get to turning this unit on and checking out what is available out of the box. As you can see, this is using a build of Gel OS, so this should be quite familiar to anyone that has used this before. So when I first booted this, I noticed that there wasn't any sound on my device at the main screen. I went into a couple games and tested various platforms and found that there wasn't any sound anywhere. My first hunch was that there was potentially something wrong with the speaker. However, I decided to just flash a micro SD card lying around just to see if it was a firmware issue, and so I grabbed the build of unofficial OS for the RG353M, and all of a sudden my device had sound. Now I really wanted to test the stock firmware, and luckily it was shared over at the Retro Handhelds Discord, and so I was able to flash the original firmware and test again. Amazingly, my sound issues resolved. Pretty weird, and definitely an odd first depression upon first boot. So with that sorted, this build of Gel OS is actually not bad. This has a pretty decent boot up time, and I am a big fan of the Gel OS interface. It's clean, fast, and it just works. Just briefly going through the Gel OS interface, you can see all of the platforms available to me. By the way, I just used a memory card I had lying around from another device, so if you've got your game set up for another device using Gel OS, Unofficial OS, and others, you should be able to just stick that micro SD card in and then have it scan your games, and you should be good to go. Here's a quick look at the tool section, and one of the coolest things for sure with Gel OS and similar Linux-based operating systems is the inclusion of Portmaster, which we will touch upon in a bit. Pressing start on the main screen will bring up another usual set of settings that you can go through and configure. So as I mentioned earlier, I can confirm that unofficial OS is working great with the device. In fact, since the time I've received the device, it now has official support for the RK2023 and is actively being developed for, so this is great news for anyone wanting an alternative. In addition, I tested Arc OS, which is another popular Linux OS for these devices. Similar to unofficial OS, Arc OS is also working great here, and likewise is receiving updates specifically for the RK2023. So it's nice to be able to report that we do have quite a few options already available for, to us for custom firmware only a few weeks after it officially went for sale. So now it's time to comment about the build quality overall of the device. The plastic definitely has a cheaper feel to it than some other devices I've held and used. It holds up pretty well to my bending, but it is showing some signs of stress and creaking. The rattling on these shoulder buttons is definitely quite noticeable and really unfortunate. It really cheapens the device and seems like something that could have easily been avoided. Again, the shoulder buttons do press down well, but you just can't help notice that noise. The D-pad really needs its edges smoothed out. For example, I have this Hori Compact Pad Pro for my Nintendo Switch, and you can see how they smooth out the edges, which makes it much more comfortable on your thumbs. Checking out how the micro SD slots work, and everything does seem to be working quite well here. The micro SD cards are easy to get in and out of the unit, the eject mechanism works properly, and the micro SD is easy to access with your finger. There's this weird imperfection on the front of the unit right under the RK2023 bezel, and you can see it pretty clearly on camera when I hold it at this angle. At first I thought this was maybe just a blemish or imperfection with my unit, but apparently some other units have this same defect. So there's obviously some issue with the molding process there, and it wasn't quite caught in the quality control process. One more time, the buttons all press down nicely, so no issues there. They do have some of the harsh edges, which is similar to the D-pad. And I just wanted to show the back again because I noticed that it's already getting scuffed up and I've barely done anything with the unit, so it's definitely not the greatest quality plastic that they are using here.
in the hands it does feel nice though i really like how compact the unit is everything is easily accessible and reachable i like that it's slightly rounded on each side to make it a little more comfortable to hold so let's take a closer look at this display i have to say i am quite impressed with how bright it gets even at 50 percent brightness this display is sufficiently visible in a normal lit room in fact i was curious and took this outside in the bright arizona sun and was impressed with how visible it was even during the daytime outside And on the other end, the brightness can be turned down quite a bit, but on its lowest setting should be quite usable at night without the lights on and shouldn't disturb your partner. The panel is a nice IPS with good viewing angles and really looks very sharp. Using something like Jell OS really looks good and you never notice the fact that this is a lower resolution screen and given what we are emulating here and the kind of power we have on hand, anything higher than 640x480 is really not necessary. One last thing, let's listen to these stereo speakers which get quite loud and are very punchy. At the maximum volume, you can hear how loud they get. And I wanted to talk about the D-pad one last time before moving on. I did my usual D-pad test in Marvel vs. Capcom 2 for Dreamcast, and I was very impressed with its performance. The diagonals and D-pad itself were very responsive, and I had no issues pulling off a combo in succession. It's really a shame that the edges of the D-pad are so rough, which will definitely impact long-term play, especially if you are a fighting or platforming game fan, because this is actually a very solid D-pad. Alright, let's move on and get some devices on the scale here. First up, of course, is the RK2023, coming in at a very light 173 grams, or just a little over 6 ounces. And of course, we're gonna have to measure up the RK2023 against some of its 3566 competitors. First, the RG353V, coming in at 6.7 ounces, or 190 grams. The RG353P, coming in at 208 grams, or just shy of 7.5 ounces. The RG503, coming in at under 8.5 ounces, or 237 grams. The metal variant, the RG353M, coming in at 231 grams, or a little over 8 ounces. And a surprise visit from the PSP Go, coming in at 5.5 ounces, or 156 grams, which is just absolutely bonkers. And one more Sony handheld, the PlayStation Vita, coming in at 219 grams or a little under 8 ounces. Here's a great family shot of all of the devices that are joining us for this video. You can really get a nice sense of the size of the RK2023 here, set in the middle of the two 3.5 inch Ambernic horizontal RK3566 handhelds. Here's a shot of the oddball Ambernic RK3566 devices, the RG353V on its side, and then the 5 inch RG503. And finally, our PlayStation visitors arranged in size order from the bottom to the top. The PSP Go really is just a marvel of engineering. Alright, let's get in a little closer and compare these devices. Here is the PSP Go resting on top of the RK2023. Again, the PSP Go is easily the smallest device out of the bunch. I really wanted to include the PSP Go because so many have commented on how the RK2023 reminds them a bit of the PSP Go because of its shape, so I figured it was fun to have it included here. Here is the RG353M and you can see how close they are in terms of their width. These devices are really so similar in terms of dimensions. Next we have the Oddball RG353P, a surprising departure from the typical Ambernic design. The vertical 353V and 353VS, which also have some similar dimensions, just in a different orientation. And finally, the last of the Ambernic bunch, the RG503, which is one of the larger RK3566 devices. Measuring the face buttons, these are nicely sized coming in at around 8mm in diameter, and then about 14.5mm for the analog stick cap. The thickness of the RK2023 comes in at around 17.5mm, and just for an idea, the RG353M comes in at about 15.5mm, so it is slightly thinner, and then the face buttons are a little over 7.5mm, which is a fairly standard size for Ambernic devices. Now it's time for one of my favorite parts of these videos, which is the teardown. We've got all of our tools ready to go here, and it's not going to take much with this one to check out the innards, so let's begin. You'll see that we have four standard screws that need to be removed before getting this back plate off. Quickly speeding through that, and the back plate is held on with some retaining tabs that are quite secure and so you will definitely require a good amount of force to get the back plate off. Now be aware that once you separate the back plate you will want to be gentle with it as there are three cables connected to the main board that are attached to this back plate as well as the battery that is glued in place behind it. So let's carefully disconnect these three cables to free the back plate from the rest of the device. 
you can see taking a closer look at why you definitely want to be careful here as these cables are soldered into place and it isn't the most elegant setup that I have seen in these RK3566 devices. You can see why it is very easy to accidentally snap off a cable if you're not careful. Now one thing you will notice is that the RK3566 SLC does not have any type of heat dispersion. I know the RG353M has a similar setup and the 353P did have a thermal pad placed down. All of these devices seem to have the battery rest on top of the SOC or at least very close to it. Personally, this gives me some anxiety just because these units can definitely heat up. Here is a nice clean shot of the inside of that backplate with the 3500 mAh battery. Alright, let's continue on and take these shoulder buttons off. Here is a closer look at one of these shoulder buttons and you can see that even here the plastic finishing isn't the greatest, however, this is not the exposed size so it's not all that critical and a quick centered shot of the motherboard before we continue to disassemble the unit. So there's the RK3566 in all of its glory. Now you might notice something is missing on this motherboard, and that is the inclusion of the onboard Wi-Fi, which this device does not have, and it really is a shame. Now believe it or not, Pal Kitty actually suggested in a social media post that you either hire a professional to solder one on for you, or you use a USB dongle. You really can't make this stuff up. I can confirm that I did use a USB-C to USB-A adapter with a USB Wi-Fi adapter and it does work without issue. I will have this specific combination linked in the description box. The other problem with this solution is that it kind of looks ridiculous. So here's a close-up of the analog stick which are not using Hall Effect sensors. Just your standard Switch style joysticks and are easily replaceable and not attached to the main board outside of the ribbing cable. Let's take a closer look at how the contacts are handled for these shoulder button areas. As you can see these are using the dome style switches which is why you get that clicky action on them. This could be a concern in terms of a point of failure as I was able to move the stand out here with not much force. So to continue with the disassembly, we need to remove the two accent strips that are on the top and bottom of the device. These are both held in place with four standard screws on each strip. As you can see, the plastic is very bendable on these strips. Okay, so it looks like we have six standard screws holding the main board in place, so let's get this removed so we can take a look at the rest of the device. Now before we do that, I'm going to carefully disconnect the ribbon cables that are attached to the main board by gently lifting the retention tabs on them and then slowly taking the cables out. Alright, with these six screws out of the way, the main board is very easy to free from the rest of the shell and now we can finally take a look at the membranes, d-pad, face buttons, and anything else of interest. Here's a closer look at how the buttons are keyed and a look at the button out of the shell. You can see how flexible the plastic is. And a closer look at the D-pad out of its shell, and you can see that center point which allows the D-pad to pivot pretty well. And finally, let's take a closer look at the membranes for the face buttons and D-pad. Okay, so with all of that, I think that about does it for the teardown section. So let's move on to the battery tests. Now in multiple testing, the battery performance was really strange. I was finally able to capture footage on camera after about 3 attempts with the battery lasting only about 5.5 hours with Yoshi's Island for Super Nintendo. This test was done with 50% brightness and 50% volume. Now if you recall from the spec readout, Pow Kitty claims that this device can get up to 8 hours of battery life, and well, 5.5 hours is kinda off from that. Now Yoshi's Island is my usual lighter test, so I decided to go back a console generation and emulate some NES instead using Kirby's Adventure, and I went with 30% brightness, which is still very playable on this screen, and 50% volume, and it looks like battery performance was just under 7 hours, a bit closer to that 8 hour claim. Finally, for a harder test of battery performance, I tested some Sonic Adventure 2 for sake of Dreamcast and the battery life came in at a little over 3 hours. Part of what made this test so difficult was that the battery indicator is incredibly unhelpful in both unofficial OS and the included Gel OS build which made tracking the battery life difficult. For example, I keep an eye on it and I peeked at the device with about 50% battery life and not much later I came back to a dead device. In fact, it was so bad that I went as far as setting up a new method to track the battery performance. One last thing to note, charging time was about 1.5 hours for me with a 5V to 2A adapter. 
Finally, one last test that I usually perform for my in-depth videos, I took the surface temperature of the device after running Sonic Adventure 2 for about 30 minutes. The device was definitely getting noticeably hot on the display area, and I observed temperatures in the low 50s around this area. On the back of the device, it was around 40 degrees Celsius. It's obvious that the RK3566 needs some way to disperse its heat properly, and as we saw in the teardown, it did not have any type of thermal pad or heat sink to do that. Surprisingly, this is one of the hotter devices that I have demonstrated on camera for temperatures. Alright, with that out of the way, let's get into emulation. We'll start with Yoshi's Island on the Super Nintendo, and the RK3566 won't have much trouble with 16-bit era games, but I want to start us off with something pretty light. Let's move into PlayStation 1 emulation, and this is an area that the RK3566 will do quite well in. Up first is, and you know, I gotta give some love to at least one shmup in this video. Here is R-Type Delta, and of course this one has no issues running on the RK2023. Here's a fantastic racing game for the PlayStation 1. Ridge Racer Type 4 was actually the Retro Handheld's Discord game of the month, and I actually completed the game entirely on this device with no issues, and it was a real blast to play again. As I mentioned before, the 4x3 aspect ratio screen is perfect for content like this. Finally, to round out the PlayStation demo with the iconic PlayStation fighting game Tekken 3, and like the others, is running very nicely on the RK2023. Now moving on to Sega Saturn, which will definitely have more issues emulating on this chipset. The reality is that Sega Saturn emulation is far more demanding than PlayStation 1 emulation. One thing worth noting though, out of the box Sega Saturn emulation was absolutely terrible. Games that I knew ran well, or at least should run better, were playing very poorly on the RK2023. You can see, and probably hear, just how poorly Sega Rally Championship is running here. You don't even need a lot of experience with the game to realize that something is very wrong here. Thankfully, custom firmware is a thing, and I was able to load Gel OS, and now Saturn emulation is as I expect with that RK3566. This is definitely an issue for someone who is just looking for an easy out-of-the-box experience, as some of these emulators are clearly not correctly configured. Now you can see how this game runs well using the latest version of Gel OS, and I think the difference in performance is quite obvious. Sega Rally Championship. Here's one more Sega Saturn game, and I just had to show off the classic Nights into Dreams on here since it looks fantastic, and again, using the latest build of Gel OS, it runs very nicely. This again was not the case when using the stock firmware.
Now let's switch platforms and move to a console that I don't think I've ever talked about here on the channel and kind of felt like showing a little bit of in this video. The 3DO was home to some pretty solid games and here is some Gex running very nicely here. Now 3DO is definitely like Saturn emulation and can be hit or miss depending on the game. Here's another console from the 5th generation that doesn't need much of an introduction. The N64 also had some weird performance issues out of the box with that stock firmware and again benefited from me using the latest version of Jell OS. Up first, here's some Cruisin' in Exotica, which is a great arcade style racer from the now defunct Midway Games and is actually the third cruising game on the Nintendo 64. And of course we can't show a Nintendo 64 game without a bit of Super Mario 64 and this one runs great on here. Finally one more for the N64 with the awesome Banjo-Kazooie from the legendary Rare. So let's switch platforms yet again to one of my personal favorites, the Dreamcast. Now I want to reiterate that performance out of the box for Dreamcast was also very mixed using that stock firmware. Games like Sonic Adventure 2 were definitely running a lot worse than I expected for the Arcade 3566 and again with the latest version of Jell OS is now running as I expect. Dreamcast will do pretty well here on the Arcade 3566, it will occasionally need some frame skipping and maybe a drop in resolution depending on the game but overall pretty decent performance. So up first is some res, and I don't believe I've ever shown this one on the channel, and for me this is such a cool game from the Dreamcast that thankfully has seen a lot of love since then. This one is doing quite well here on the RK2023. And now as I mentioned earlier, here is some footage of Sonic Adventure 2 running on the RK2023. I am using the latest version of Jell OS to get the performance that you are seeing here. Sonic Adventure 2 is definitely one of those games that benefits from light frame skipping, but it does play well. Finally, here is some Dead or Alive 2, which I think is the upper limit of smooth Dreamcast emulation on the RK2023 and RK3566 chipset. Regardless, I think this one is playing surprisingly a lot better than I expected for the RK3566, and again, I definitely recommend using a custom firmware. Alright, here's a fun one that I had to show in this video, and that is some Atomus Wave, which has always been an arcade platform that has always interested me because of a very cool game that never received a home console port. Dolphin Blue is an absolutely slick Metal Slug style game with phenomenal graphics and fast running gun gameplay. Recently, the game was ported to the Dreamcast by the homebrew community, which is just so cool to see running. The version you are seeing here is the Atomus Wave version and not the ported Dreamcast one. And here's a little bit of PSP. Now this is a platform that does better than expected, but on a 4x3 aspect ratio device like the RK2023, I personally don't like playing PSP games this way. However, I know that for some this isn't an issue, and I still wanted to include some footage of PSP on this device. So first, here's a little footage of Burnout Legends running in its native 16x9 aspect ratio with the black bars on the top and bottom. And now some footage of the same game stretched to fill the entire screen. You can see that Burnout Legends, despite a few hiccups, is quite playable. I'd say that PSP is definitely on the upper end of the limitations of a device like the RK2023 and expect heavier games to give you issues or require heavy tweaking.
Finally, one last game for our gameplay showcase, and one of the coolest things about the Linux-based retro handhelds running something like Jell OS and Arc OS is having access to Portmaster, which opens an additional library of games of various game ports. One such game is the recently released Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge, and as you can see, it does quite well here on the RK2023. Portmaster is easily one of my favorite things available for devices like the RK2023. And so we are reaching the end of this in-depth video. The RK2023 is probably one of my most divisive handhelds to date. There is so much I actually like about this handheld, and it has been a joy playing on the device for the past few weeks. I completed Ridge Racer Type 4 on it, and I really enjoyed my time with it. I like that it's light and compact and comes with a great bright screen, but unfortunately there are a few misses with the device. The device does have some questionable design choices, its build quality isn't as good as some others in this space, and its lack of Wi-Fi in 2023 can definitely be seen as a con. At its original price of around $90, it was going against the RG353 VS, which is essentially a better device in almost every way. But if you're not a fan of vertical handhelds, the RK2023 obviously enters the conversation. And for the price it's available at now, which is around $70, it becomes a little more appealing. If you are really looking for the absolute best price to performance, the RK2023 is surprisingly a decent value when it comes to that, as it costs a little more than a MiU Mini Plus and RG35XX, but obviously has a bit more power to offer. In the vast amount of RK3566 devices to choose from, the RK2023 is the cheapest entry point into that SOC. Now, as long as you are willing to accept its shortcomings, it's surprisingly a pretty competent handheld, especially with proper custom firmware. The RK3566 space is seemingly not finished yet, and Pow Kitty has the upcoming X55, and Ambernick is planning a 353 PS, and so the RK3566 continues on in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Which means that I will be returning to the RK3566 yet again. Until then, let me know what you think about this device. Is this another handheld from Pow Kitty that comes close but misses the mark? Is it a handheld that you are considering because of the value? Let me know down in the comments, and I look forward to interacting with everyone. As always, this is the Retro Tech Dad, and thank you so much for watching.